I really want to talk to you about transitions. And we are in a moment of time when this episode is going to come out where there's tons of people graduating and that's a major transition. And I am personally bracing. Dr. Marquez, I'm, I'm bracing. Our daughter is graduating from college. Oh my God. I can feel the panic attack happening. Graduation is in 10 days. Wow. Wow. She is then going to leave California and come home for the summer. Wow. And she is an artist, a singer-songwriter, so there's no defined career path. Mm-hmm. And I know that the bottom is going to drop out. Why are transitions so damn hard? Hmm. Well, I can I can feel the pain already for you, Mel. <laughs> like I can just I can just feel like your whole voice changed. And there's so many people in this. But in fact, the world is in transition since COVID. It's a major transition. This is how I think of a transition. Before we even talk about why it happens or you know why it's so hard, is the way I see transition is somebody wants to go on a journey. Okay, and there's this idea of this dream life, or this thing that you want to do. Um, and some are voluntary, some are not. Like your daughter is finishing, it's a voluntary transition after college, and she has this whole life ahead of her. And so that's exciting. But then there is the old, right? And the old mm-hmm. I see as the shore. And so in transitions, we're like holding on to the shore of what we know, the certainty of the things that we mm-hmm. know sort of worked. It's no longer working, by the way, because you want this dream life. And then the boat starts to leave. And you're holding on to shore, and you're holding on to the boat, and you start to get stretched thin. And that's what we start to feel. It's that panic that you're talking about. Yeah. It's that anxiety. It's that uncertainty that happens. But we are so afraid of discomfort. We avoid discomfort so much that we just continue to hold on. And this is the first thing I want to say to everybody. Let go and start swimming. Let go and start swimming because there is no ticket to a perfect life, right? That holding on is avoidance. And how many people have we heard that stay in a job they dislike, right? It's like holding on to certainty. I mean, I'm in the major of a transition in my life, in a career, and I'm as scared as you are, but like, if I just hold on to Harvard because that's what makes me good enough, then I'm never going to get to explore the world. Wait a minute. What's the transition here in the middle of? Well, so, you know, for the past year and a half, I really hit a wall at Harvard MS General. And I love what I did in terms of research, but I... I felt like there's so much more that I could do to help so many more people. I wanted to have an impact in the global world in terms of mental health. I wanted to bring that down. And let's be honest, an academic paper is not going to do it, right? It's just not. But I've been terrified to let go of this position and this academic self to jump into this like public speaking, writing books. And I don't have a path for that. And so like when people ask me what I do now, it's like, well, I do a bunch of things. And, and you know, eventually I'll talk about like the integration of it. But like it is scary in transition. It really is. The first thing we all have to talk about is there's fear there. For sure there's fear there. Well, I'm, of course, on the other side of the table from you. And I'm really excited because I see a huge opportunity for you to make a massive impact by spending more of your time in the public realm, sharing your work and helping and impacting millions of people's lives by writing books and doing whatever else you may do. But I want to go and talk about the fact that when you write about transitions, Mm -hmm. especially here in your new book, You talk about values, like what is the intersection of the transitions that we all have to go through in life, whether you're going to move or you're breaking up or you're changing jobs or you're thinking about your dreams or college is ending. Mm -hmm. What is the intersection of values and transitions? So values are so important. And yet most of the time when we talk about them, I feel like values are like a painting in somebody's house. You sort of know they are there, but you don't pay attention to them. Mm. So let's define values first, right? Okay. Values are intrinsic motivators. They are the things that matter the most to us, the things that should be our compass in life, mm. family, religion, um, wealth, um, integrity, right? And so what is the intersection between values and transitions? Well, in transitions, our values are questioned. What matters the most to us? Let me give you a personal example to make this come to life for everybody. Yeah. Early on in my career, 
ambition was the value that mattered the most to me. Okay, And once you have a value, then we set goals with those values. For me, it was getting to graduate school. Then I had a goal of getting to Harvard. Then I was an instructor, so I wanted to be an assistant professor. Right? Ambition was the value, and then I set clear goals to those values. Eventually, I got to associate professor. The day I became associate professor, a colleague of mine said to me, so what are you going to do next to become full professor? And that question bothered me. I was like, but do I want to be a full professor? Hmm. I had driven ambition because the ambition got me out of poverty. Ambition got me out of Brazil. Ambition is how I define how I would never go back to be poor again. But no longer ambition is working for me now. I'd lay in bed at night. And I had all the success in Harvard. And yet my brain was just not happy. I couldn't sleep. I put on 40 pounds, 40 pounds, right? And I kept saying to myself, what if? I just write another grant. What if I just write another paper? You know, I, I don't have the right to feel the way I do with all the privilege mm. I have. And, and so ambition no longer was serving me, but I kept going at it, kept going at it. And one day, I'm sitting in my office writing a grant, and um, half of my face went numb, just numb. And the first thought I had is, one, this is anxiety. You're unhappy at work. You're writing a grant. This is just anxiety. Next thing you know, half of my body starts to tingling, and I'm terrified. And then the next thing I thought is, oh, my God, I'm having a stroke. Yeah. I'm having a stroke. So I called the nurse. And, and meanwhile, I'm like, I'm an anxiety researcher. I treat anxiety. This is just anxiety. I want to say myself. But like half of my body is numb. And I just end up, the, the doctor, my husband, like, drives me. I'm crying. And at that point, I remember going to my primary care mag, Mel, and saying to myself, oh, my God, I hit rock bottom. Like, this is no longer working. I know what I'm doing is no longer working. But now I'm about to lose everything. Right, I avoided for so long, and now I'm having a stroke. And what if I can't speak again? What if I like everything in my life that I had worked so hard was right in front of me, and and I just had this moment of like, holy shit, like holy shit, I've avoided for so long by following this value that no longer served me, yeah. and just to avoid my transition. Well, that's all I was doing. I was avoiding this transition. And so it turned out that I wasn't having a stroke, thank God. And they think it was a severe migraine. I've never had a migraine in my life. I don't, I don't know. The neurologist, like, it was 48 hours of hell of, like, trying to just look. And, and that's when I faced reality. Like, that moment was when I paused and was like, I cannot avoid this transition anymore. I'm no longer actually living a value-driven life. I'm living an emotion-driven life. I'm just trying to not feel uncomfortable. So I keep doing the things. Mm. And you asked me an important question in the beginning. Why this transition is so hard, right? Why does it hurt so much? Is because it creates so much discomfort. And in that moment, I was just avoiding it. I was just avoiding it. And I couldn't avoid it anymore. And, and I just hope, and the reason I share this with people is I hope people wake up before they hit that wall because we hold on to the old so much to, to not go towards our dreams. And I nearly killed myself in the process. And look at this. And, and think about how much skills I have. And I still avoided it. How do you figure out what your values are? So one of the exercises I use with my patients that I use that day is to actually do the opposite of what anybody does, which is to lean towards the pain. In the days after that nearly stroke, I sat with myself crying early in the morning for many mornings, saying, why does this hurt so much? Mm. What about this hurts so much? What is it that is missing? Like, what is in my life missing? And what I realized is pain only exists because behind that pain, there is a value that's extremely important that's being violated. It's not that I didn't care about ambition anymore. Is that what I really cared about is I wanted to make a bigger impact on the world. Mm. And I knew that the things I was doing were not aligned with impact. They make impact on the patients that I work for sure. But I saw the world hurting. I saw the rise in anxiety from the CDC of 40% of Americans with clinical level of anxiety and depression. And here I was sitting in my little house with all the skills that my grandmother gave me, that science gave me, and I wasn't doing anything with it. I wanted to create a podcast. I didn't have a podcast. I wanted to write a book. I hadn't written a book. I wanted to go out there and meet people like you, and I wasn't doing it. And when I leaned into that pain, I saw impact, and I was like, wait a minute. I need to change my entire life. I need to change what I do. 
And so that's my recommendation. Lean towards the pain and ask yourself, why does this hurt? Because somebody is an asshole to you, okay? Right. They say something mean to you, you just say they're an asshole. But if somebody that you love very much says something like, you hurt me tremendously, now it hurts you. Yeah. It hurts you because you probably care about that person, because you probably love that person. It's not just they said something mean, is that it violated a core value. Wow. So are there, I'm trying to think about the example between kind of the transition that you're describing, which is one that I recently went through, like probably over the last two years of, again, achieved incredible success, but at a cost. And I knew that there was something that I valued more than chasing more success. Mm -hmm. And it was about connection and impact and peace and family and simplicity and artistry. Like it was about, a, and you can have more than mm -hmm. one value, right? A hundred percent. You can have more than one value. But, but slow it down for us, Mel, if you don't mind. Because like, I just love what you're saying, but like, how, how last, can you just tell me a little bit about the beginning of this transition and like chasing success and no longer feeling like success did it? Well, yeah. Like I, I, um, I think like a lot of people. Somewhere along the line, I got the subliminal or subconscious message that achievement equals love. Yes. That if you're performing, if you're busy, if you are making a lot of money, if you're winning awards, if you're doing things that people talk about, mm -hmm. that that means you're worthy yeah. of somebody's love and attention. Yes. And so having that be a really big motivator, like, you know, you say ambition, I would say if I went a level deeper, it would be love and self-worth. Yes. That was a value that I was trying to create in myself. Of course, I wanted to make an impact. Of course, I, you know, wanted to, to creatively express myself and connect with other people. But my work allowed me to do that. But there was still something that I was pushing up against. Yeah. Because what started to happen for me is that once I got to a level of success where I had paid off our debt and I was actively saving money and I could afford to do kind of whatever I wanted to do. I'm like, I'm not talking Lamborghinis and that mm -hmm. kind of crap, but like just had a really great lifestyle mm -hmm. and was proud of myself. I wasn't happy. Yeah. And like you, I felt like an asshole. You didn't use that word, but I'll use that word with myself. I'm like, what kind of an asshole are you? You're sitting here making an impact on millions of people's lives. You are able to stand on stages and share a message that changes people's lives. You are being flown first class all over the place. You can afford to eat anywhere you want. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. And what was wrong with me is one of my core values, if I put it into the language of your work, was severely violated. Yeah. I was profoundly disconnected from my husband, profoundly disconnected from my kids and even my more extended family because I never saw anybody because I was working. I had exactly two friends that I saw. Yeah. And so I was profoundly lonely. That's it. And I was never not working. And so... I just was like, something's got to give. And what actually gave is March 8th of 2020. Yeah. When my talk show got canceled and all of a sudden the world turned upside down and I found myself like the entire planet found themselves mm -hmm. questioning absolutely everything. And what the greatest gift of that massive global transition was for me is it made me really assess what my values truly were and when my husband and our three kids were then under one roof together it made me realize how much that's all I wanted to do was yeah. be with them and when I started to do my work not on stages and not by getting on planes I'm like you know what Mel it's time to stop talking about and thinking about doing a podcast it's time to get serious about it mm -hmm. Yes, you have integrity, so you got to wrap up a lot of obligations to be able to do this the right way. Mm -hmm. And yes, operating with excellence is part of your value. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take some time to launch the way that you're going to want to launch. 
But that was the moment for me. It was values driven. And I asked you the question about how you figure out your values because it's a surprisingly hard thing to do. It, it is so hard. It is so hard. And, and you actually unpacked so much because, you know, I, I think the world has gone through a value shift in this pandemic. How so? Because the things, the values that worked before the pandemic no longer fit for most people, right? People now, we hear people talking about they want more flexibility in their job. They want to work from home. Why? Because they realize the family mattered and it was being compromised by the way they worked and did their family time. Mm. Right. But most people now haven't had the privilege of what you have of being able to pause and reflect. Right. A lot of people are still in the treadmill of life. That's what I see in my office. People call me and they're still trying to fit their old values to this post pandemic life. It needs a realignment. And how do you find your values is your question. So I talked about pain. The other way to find values, which I think is what happened to you, is this lean into the moments that you feel your best. Okay, mm. what about the moments? What's so important, right? You talked about being with your family. The way you said, you know, my three kids and my husband, you lighten up. I could just see you in your living room with them during the pandemic. And I could, if I went behind your brain, I could see just Mel being content, connected, and present. Yes. Right? Versus Mel on the stage was impacting a bunch of people, but then you're in that plane. And you're craving that connection, that real connection with family. And so in those moments of like flow, in those moments of quietness, ask yourself, what matters in this moment? Why is this moment important to me? Why do I feel good? And that's our values are right there. Like I know this. I do dinner with my family every day. Okay. And connection and family are two of the values for me are super important. So much so that, you know, I came to see you and I'm flying to Miami this week and I'll be gone for my son for five days. My husband looked at me and said, you know what? I think we should come with you because you need that connection before you're away from him. It's not mm. going to feel good to be away from him Sat Sunday and Monday and then the rest of the week. Yeah. And so pulled him out of school. They came with me. And this morning he said to me, can we stay an extra day? I really like it here. <laughs> <laughs> and just that made me feel so connected with him. Right. And so those moments allow us to be connected. I wish it were easy. It is easy to identify friction. It is easy to identify your excuses. It is easy to identify the actions that you need to take. But taking those actions and feeling the emotions that come up and dealing with people's reactions, that's not easy. And it's really important for you to accept that and for me to accept that. Because when you accept the fact that change isn't easy, but it's possible and it's worth it and you're capable of it, that's the truth. And when you go into addressing all the areas of your life that aren't working, whatever that may be for this moment in your life right now. When you start this process and you remember these three things that your life is always trying to teach you something and the biggest teacher is areas of your life that create friction. Full stop, period. The second lesson, that your excuses are bullshit. Every single excuse you have is tied to some fear that you have. That's it. And that every single excuse can be faced and addressed with a small action. Again and again and again. Now, the third lesson is really important because it's the truth. Change isn't easy. I mean, this year I uh, reorganized the team. I addressed the betrayal. I... Um, got seriously into therapy to improve a lot of friction in my marriage, both on my side and Chris's side. Not easy. It's not easy to sit in a therapy session and have to listen and hear stuff you don't want to hear. And it's not easy to change your own behavior when you've been doing things the right, for a long time. It's not easy to go to the gym for the first time. Heck, you know, I went to a hot yoga class when I was visiting my daughter in Los Angeles last week. I realize it's the first time I have been in an exercise studio for three years. 
it wasn't easy to get there. Now, I was happy I went when it was over, but I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that this is easy. When you know going into it that it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be worth it, damn it, and that I am capable, I am capable of showing up for myself, I am capable of doing this, I am capable of inching along, I am capable of pushing through the fear. I am capable of identifying friction. I am capable of slowly moving my life from the shitty side to the awesome side. When you go into it knowing that, like that's what I did with this house. When we sold our house in Boston, that was not easy. I knew I needed to do it. I knew I needed to remove that variable from my life. That was not easy. And not only was it not easy, but I had a pretty big mental breakdown over it. I did not, I did not expect the wave of grief that was going to hit me selling the home that we raised our kids in for 26 years. I did not expect how discombobulated I would feel moving from a place that I had lived for 26 years and the container that held all those memories in that much time. It knocked me on my rear end. It was not easy at all. But now that I am on the other side of it, thanks to therapy and going back on an antidepressant for the first time in 20 years, I'll tell you, it was worth it. And I was capable of putting my life into the column of being in alignment. I am proud of myself. I am proud of myself for doing the work to finally launch this podcast. I am proud of myself, not because it's doing so well. I mean, of course, that's freaking amazing because your support makes me feel good. And I just can't believe what a force for good you and I are, that these episodes are truly changing and even saving people's lives. I mean, that's just extraordinary. But I'm proud of myself because I got over my own bullshit to do this. Do you know how liberating that is? When you push through your own stuff, when you commit to your happiness and to your goals, knowing this is not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. Knowing that I got what it takes within me to remove friction, to go toward the things that I want. It is like one of the most amazing things in the world. And yeah, you may be like my son Oakley, sitting upstairs alone in a closet with nobody watching as you put your first video out there. Who cares? You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for you and the potential of your life and the dreams that you have inside of you and the happiness that you deserve. Like I, I really feel like there's kind of two states in life because it's about energy. You're either feeling friction and that means something's off and there's just something to address. Don't Beat yourself up. Big lesson for me. Just learn the lesson, everybody, because your life is trying to teach you something with that friction. Make your list. Any area where there's life, where there's friction, there's a pattern to address. There's a place that's making you miserable. There's somebody, a person. That's it. That's it. That's all that there is. There's a, that, 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 there's a process. There is a process. Every breakdown that Chris and I have basically has to do with the fact that we have a broken process. When we are not in communication, Chris retreats and I keep going. And then Chris feels rejected. He feels taken advantage of. I have no idea because I'm blazing ahead 55 miles an hour. And what is broken is the communication process. Doesn't mean we're bad people. Doesn't mean the marriage sucks. It means there's friction between us because there's a broken process. And so again, this is such a huge invitation. Please, please do not run yourself into a wall the way I did. Do not ignore the lessons in your life that your life is trying to teach you via friction. Because they are going to get louder. That sledgehammer is a coming. And do not be a stubborn student like Mel Robbins. 
Do not wait for life to punch you in the face or knock you on your fanny or cause you to have a mental health breakdown requiring prescription medication, which, by the way, there's nothing wrong with. Sometimes we need those ladders. Sometimes we need it every day, people. I freaking love, love my Celexa right now. Thank you, Celexa. You have helped me through this shitty year. I am proud, proud to ask for help, whether it's for people or it's medication or it's new habits or it's from you, because sometimes it's not easy, but it's worth it. And you're capable of doing whatever it takes. And it might take you years. It took me decades to finally learn the lesson about people that have toxic patterns and betrayal and my role in it too. Decades. It took me 10 years to realize that all of my success was born in a moment of crisis. You know, I didn't, I didn't go, I think I'll write a book today. I'm like, I got bills to pay in a lien on my house. And my husband basically has just left his business Uh, and he's sobering up and he's depressed. And if we're going to pay bills, I got to figure this shit out. And I have never gotten out of that mode. Like when you can't pay for groceries, when you got liens on your house, you will say yes to anything that you need to say yes to, to stay afloat. And I don't think I ever got out of the mode of relating to work as though I was in an emergency. I always assumed my luck would run out which is why I've been running like my life depends upon it. And that's why I ultimately hit a brick wall. It wasn't working anymore. It was making me miserable. And so when you stop and you write out the friction and you look at the lessons, please, like, do it now. Do not do the same stuff over and over and over for decades like I have. You do not need to wait for a sledgehammer. You can wake yourself up with a blank sheet of paper and two columns and a pen. And you will wake yourself up faster if you have a friend with you who will be a truth teller. And you also need to honor the things that are working about your life. Because guess what? There are a lot of things that are working. And we need to do more of that. And when you are willing to learn the lessons that your life is teaching you at this moment, and there's always lessons. I'm sorry. It's whack-a-mole, people. That's what life is. You're going to fit. Here's the bad news. I got a lot of shit on the left-hand column now, too. It just is different stuff from last year. Because life is whack-a-mole. Life is, uh, life is school, people. You can enjoy it. You can hate it. But you got to attend it. That's, that's the deal. And there's a lesson every day. And the biggest lessons are in the biggest moments of friction and the highest moments of joy. And if you get serious about paying attention to the lessons and you get serious about your own baloney excuses and you get serious about just taking actions and inching forward every day and you embrace this notion, change isn't easy, but it's worth it and I'm capable of it. You, my friend, will feel the happiness you deserve. You will remove the just stupid crap that you're tolerating. You will level up. You will make more money. You will enjoy it. Imagine that. Imagine enjoying it. And I realize you may be taking care of aging parents or you've got super little kids or you just went through a divorce or you got a big health crisis or you're in the middle of pitching a venture capital firm for the biggest deal of your life. The stakes are high. I get that stuff's going on. But I also know, because I have done this in my own life this year, that you can see what the lesson is. You can stop beating yourself up. You can fix the pattern. You can fix the personal dynamics. You can fix the places that you're showing up. You can fix the process. You do that. You get to work. And my God, you're going to be shocked, shocked at how proud you're going to be of yourself. And I want you to know that I'm here every single day because I know you can do it. 
If you don't believe it, let me be the person holding up the, the light over here going, hey, come on, walk towards me. I'll hold this light high till you catch up with me. And then guess what? I'm going to get hit with a sledgehammer and I'm going to expect you to go forward and hold that damn light high and remind me that I'm going to be okay. Because the second that you start to move things of friction from one column to the other, other friction will show up. One of your kids will have a breakdown. It, it just always like a charm, right? People always say, how are your kids doing? I'm like, well, today, today everybody's okay. Because God knows tomorrow somebody could have a mental breakdown. It's whack-a-mole. But we're playing it together, right? We're going to ride the waves together, everybody. All right, so today is my 52nd birthday. And um, normally on my birthday, I wake up excited because I feel like I've just been handed a clean slate and the opportunity to create a brand new year. And um, I spend the day reflecting on the last couple of years and I spend um, the day brainstorming about what I want to create this year. And this year is not a normal year. I did not wake up feeling excited. I woke up feeling lost. Because as I thought back over the last few years, it's been an incredible adventure, but I've experienced a tremendous amount of change in my professional and personal life that has just knocked me on my knees. From losing my daytime talk show, to having my book contract rescinded, to having the speaking business basically implode until at least another year from now, um, to not being able to be with you face to face, to not being able to work with my team face to face. I just got rocked. And then on top of it, our son wanted to go to high school in Vermont. And so we are in the process of moving from the home that we've been in for over 20 years and raised our kids up to a very small town in Southern Vermont where I know very few people and I feel very disconnected. And the result of all this is I feel stuck in between two lives. Uh, my old life, which has ended, and a new life that I have yet to create for myself. And when I look ahead to the future, I feel overwhelmed, I feel lost, I feel disconnected. I, in some ways I feel like I don't even know who I am because <laughs> I feel so disconnected from the things that make me feel alive and happy. Oh my God. I was really lost. I mean, just hearing 52-year-old me sound like that so sad. It just puts a pit in my stomach. Oh, my God. And look, I can kind of laugh about it now because I'm on the other side of this thing. But when you're in it, it can be overwhelming. If I could go back in time and talk to the 52-year-old me, here's what I would do. I would say, first of all, that's a lot. You should have a good cry. Then I would give Mel a big, huge hug. Because in moments like that, we need reassurance. But then, then comes a tough love. I'd be like, look, Mel, you got to remember who you are. You can face this. And then I would drop this quote on her. Hey, woman, if you want to fly, you got to give up the shit that weighs you down. Toni Morrison said that, and boy, ain't that the truth. You got to give up the shit that weighs you down. And a lot of times, at least with me, what's weighing me down, it's my own attitude. And I know you can relate to that. I just hate that saying. It is what it is. No, it isn't. It is what you make it to be. The fact is, there is always something you can do to make yourself feel just a little bit better. And when you do something that makes you feel a little better, no matter what's going on, that boost in your mood, that boost in your attitude, it is essential to helping you face any challenge and improve any situation. And even though in that video I felt lost, there were three things that I did and that I continued to do over the past two years and that I continue to do now, all of which is rooted in research to pick myself back up and face the mess that my life had become. And more importantly, to start doing the work to create the life I wanted. I believe that you are capable of changing. I do. I've just seen too much evidence over the course of my career 
amazing changes that people just like you and me have made. So I know you're thinking, well, this is great, Mel, but where do I begin? So step number one, you begin by making a wish. Just like that moment on your birthday when you close your eyes and wish for something to come true in this next year of your life. Right now, do the same. Close your eyes and think about the next year of your life. What do you want the next year of your life to look like? Begin by making a wish. That's how I began two years ago. Yep, my business was upside down. Kids were in shambles. My husband was struggling with depression. And I was struggling with everything. I had to create a break from that moment of pain and allow myself to see something different. At the time, I had no idea what the new chapter of my life would be or could be. Here's what I did know. I don't want to stay in this one. And that's all you need to know. All you need to know is you don't want to stay in the place that you're in right now. That right there is a wish for something better. If you know what you don't want, it's very easy to change. As soon as you start removing or letting go of things that aren't working, you'll see all new possibilities. So let's go back to that video that I made on my 52nd birthday, because once I laid it all out there, I instinctually laid out the three steps I was going to take. I made a wish. I identified some things that I could do that would make me feel a little better. And I also changed my attitude. And if I can do it, so can you. So let's go back to the rest of that video from my 52nd birthday. And you're about to hear 52-year-old Mel wipe away the tears and start taking action. Here are the steps I'm going to take. Number one, self-awareness is critical. So recognizing that you feel lost or disconnected or suspended between your old life and your new life, overwhelmed, whatever you feel, it's so important to name it. Because when you name it, you bring it out of the feeling in your body and out into the world, and then you can do things to tame that feeling. Number two, the most important thing that you should do is move your body because all this negative emotion is trapped in your body right now. And it's only through exercise and motion that you'll move it out of your body and you'll change your emotional state. So I am going to go put on an exercise tape and work up a sweat. Will that solve all my problems? No, but it will put me in a better emotional state so that I can think more clearly and more optimistically and start to see solutions. Number three, the best advice about happiness is happy people do things that make them happy. And so after you move your body and you change your emotional state, do one thing that makes you happy. And for me, I'm gonna go out and buy myself some beautiful flowers. I've been doing a lot of writing this morning, just dumping all my thoughts onto paper. And I think journaling out your thoughts is a really important thing to do when you feel stuck or overwhelmed or suspended. And then finally, continue to remind yourself that this is temporary. This is temporary. This moment is temporary. These feelings are temporary. This feeling of stuckness and overwhelm is temporary. Oh, Ooh. oh, 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 those sneezes are temporary. And I think the biggest thing about that mantra that this is temporary is so is your life. And maybe that's why birthdays are overwhelming because they always make you think about the timeline of your life. And so after you become self-aware and you move your body, which moves your emotions and you do something simple that makes you happy and you dump all your thoughts on a piece of paper, remind yourself that this is temporary and force yourself to start dreaming again. Because when you give up on your dreams, you give up on yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons why I woke up feeling lost today. When I look ahead, I don't see anything I'm looking forward to because I haven't created something new to look forward to. And that's the secret. How you're feeling right now is a function of what you see in the future. And if you see overwhelm and a blank page and nothingness, that's how you're gonna feel right now. And so I want you to dream big. I want you to put something on that paper that's out in that future that calls to you, that gives you something to look forward to, to go for. That's how you will pull yourself out of it. And that's how I'm gonna pull myself out of this too. 
So that's my birthday message. Not really inspiring. It's authentic and it's real because this is where I am right now. And I also know that despite how low I feel, I have a choice. I have a choice about what I do about it. I have a choice about who I'm gonna be in the face of it. And I have a choice about what comes next. So by God, I'm going to five, four, three, two, one, push myself to create a future that really empowers me. And I want you to do the same too. If you could do anything for me for my birthday, it would be for you to dream really big today. That would mean everything to me. I love you. Way to go, 52-year-old me. Mel, if you could only see where you end up two years later, you'd be so proud of yourself, woman. And you know what? When you follow these same three simple steps, you're going to be proud of yourself too. And I want to make sure you're not just listening along or watching this podcast episode on YouTube. I want to make sure you're able to apply these three takeaways and what you're learning in this episode to your own life right now. So let's recap what you've learned so far. You've learned about the fresh start effect and how temporal landmarks can trigger a whole new chapter in your life and unlock the intrinsic motivation that's inside you that's going to help you take action. Let's create your fresh start right now. Step one, you already heard this, make a wish. Just ask yourself one powerful question. What do I want the next year of my life to look like? Number two, no matter how you feel, start taking the actions that align with what you want in your life. Stop making the mistake of waiting to feel happy or motivated before you take action. The secret, it's taking action first, because if you can get moving, you can keep moving. And research shows that just a little boost in your mood impacts your productivity for the rest of the day. It impacts your focus. It gives you a little uptick in energy. Taking actions that align with the bigger vision and the future you, it taps into this huge body of research called behavioral activation therapy. Now, you're going to learn a tremendous amount about this therapy modality in future episodes of the Mel Robbins podcast, but here's how I'd summarize it for you. Act like the person you want to become in the future, no matter how you feel in the present moment. Look, I know it sounds simple. Act like the future you. But this is grounded in decades of research, and it works. This is how I've made every single change in my life. Once I figure out what I want to do or the kind of person I want to become, I figure out someone else in the world that's doing it, and I just reverse engineer it. And that's how you create a brick path that leads from where you are right now to where that wish of yours wants to take you. And every morning, wake up, take one action that aligns with what you want or the person that you want to become. And you can consider that action, it represents one brick. And if you keep doing that day by day, brick by brick, action by action, you're going to look up a year from now and you'll realize, oh my God, I just paved a brick path leading to my dreams. What the heck? Mel was right. And step number three in making powerful change in your life, find the proof that you can do it. It's all around you. You just need to look for it. Find anyone that has the life that you want or that has made the change that you want to make. The relationship, the career, the body, the family, the friend group. Anytime you see someone who has already made the change you want to make in your life, tell yourself, there's proof. It exists. Use people as evidence that, yes, you can have what you wish for, too, if you're willing to work for it. See people as a light on the path to your future self. For years, that was not me. I was the opposite. I did not see other people as lights on my path. I saw people as robbing me of the lights that I wanted. I had this really stingy, jealous, and insecure attitude. If a friend of mine was renovating their kitchen, I would smile that tight smile that people have when they're faking a smile. And I'd go, oh, it's so pretty. I love the white cabinets. But inside, I was seething with jealousy. And the reason why is because I believed that somebody else's happiness or success somehow was robbing me of mine. It's the opposite. Their beautiful kitchen, 
means if I can work for it, I can have one too. Their amazing relationships means I can create it too. Their success or the business they've built means it's possible for you too. This alone, if you just do this third step, this one mindset flip, it is a complete game changer. Here's how you do it. There is unlimited success, happiness, and fulfillment in the world. You're not in competition with anyone. The only one that can rob you of the success, happiness, and fulfillment that you deserve is you and your excuses and fears and sitting around waiting to feel motivated. We're going to stop that today. Correct? Good. I'm glad you're listening because we're not doing that anymore. You're not going to wait six years to get started. You are going to start taking actions that align with what you want now. And when you see other people as evidence of what's possible for you, as you start seeing them not as extinguishing your light, but lighting the path that you're now walking on, holy cow, talk about throwing gasoline on that internal fire of yours. And by the way, don't you ever forget, you are a light on the path for someone else. And you don't even realize it. So think about that for a second. You are just a step or two ahead of someone else. I mean, if you've grieved the loss of a loved one, if you've changed your career, if you've survived heartache, if you've sold a family home, if you've reinvented some aspect of your life, if you've lost weight, if you're able to live with depression, if you were the first in your family to graduate from college, your life experience proves to someone else that it's possible for them too. So you better make sure that as you start chipping away at your own wishes and goals, that you hold that light up a little bit higher for everybody that's behind you. Now, these steps sound super simple. So I'm going to go through them one more time because I want to make sure you get how powerful they are. So let's go back to 52-year-old Mel. And let me explain how each one of these steps worked for me back when I was sad and lost two years ago. So step number one, you make a wish. You got to consider that question. What do I want my life to look like? Now, here's the truth. I couldn't answer that question two years ago. When I was 52, sitting there crying in the bunk room, I had no idea. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't even know how to fix all my problems. And that's okay. You don't have to know the answers because those will come. But I did know I didn't want to stay feeling sad. And that's all I needed to start the change. Because step two is, once you know one small thing, I don't want to feel so sad. I don't want to be lost on my birthday. Just take actions that align with that thing that you want. I wanted to be happier. So I just focused on simple things I could do in that day to make me feel a little better. I get it. This isn't rocket science, but it works. But somehow, when you start to apply this stuff, it does feel like rocket science because it does launch you somewhere else. So that day I exercised, I bought myself flowers, I watched some stand-up comedy specials on TV so I would laugh a little. I just forced myself to do those things, to start walking toward what I wanted, which was just to feel a little happier. And look, this stuff doesn't work overnight, it works over time. And so every day I just woke up, and I kept making myself do the things that made me feel a little better, even though I didn't feel like it. Simple things, exercising, journaling. And I kept on contemplating that question, what do I want my life to look like? And over time, day after day, brick after brick, as I added in positive forward action, aligned with feeling a little happier, and as I started to let go of things that were bringing me tension or sadness or friction, the answers started to emerge. I didn't want to travel so much for work. I didn't want to miss out on my son's high school the way I missed out on our daughter's high school experience. I wanted to get reconnected at a really deep level with my husband. I wanted to have time to see friends again and do things in the community. I didn't want to feel so damn busy and burnt out. And I didn't want to fall asleep with a to-do list on my mind and wake up every morning panic-stricken because of how much I had to get done. I wanted to simplify my life and get serious about being happier and more content in it. And as you ask yourself the question, what do you want your life to look like? 
be patient. As I got clearer about what I wanted, and then I aligned my actions with that new vision, I started acting like the person I wanted to become. Simplifying means saying no. It means asking for help. And I chipped away day by day, and I started getting my mental health in order, slowed down, and I created an entirely different relationship with my husband by jumping into therapy. I also started being more present with my kids. And through all these small changes, I realized something bigger. It was time to sell the house that we had raised our kids in for 26 years outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and create a simpler life in Southern Vermont. And as I started to say no and put what mattered to me first, I all of a sudden had more time to do what I really wanted, which is to launch this podcast because I wanted to forge a deeper connection with you. Brick by brick, I laid a path with my actions, and now here I am. And if I can do it, you can do it. And that's why step number three is critical. Look for lights on the path. I looked for other people who had simpler business models, who had relationships, and who were doing the fun things that I wanted to do. And I just let them light the way toward the future I wanted. I kept telling myself, if they can do it, I can do it. And if you don't have anyone in your life like that, someone that lights the way for you, let me be that person. Tell yourself if Mel Robbins can do it, then I can do it because it's true. I'm living proof that if I can do it, you can do it. Big change starts with small wishes, like I want to feel happier. And tiny actions lead to massive transformation over time. Psychologically speaking, those little daily moves forward that I was making trying to just be a little bit happier, moving toward the person I really wanted to become, it changes what you believe about yourself. Because doing the small things every single day, especially when you don't feel like it, it proves that you do have a choice about what you do and how you feel. And eventually, as you do the small things that make you feel better and better and better, you will feel better and better and better. And as you see yourself taking these little actions, you start seeing yourself taking control. And the momentum, the pride, and the confidence builds inside you. That's what happened to me. And I know the same will be true for you. And I have proof that this works. So yesterday, check this out. I got an email from a woman named Danielle. And guess what she was writing me about? She was writing to tell me. About a year ago, she stumbled upon guess what video. Yeah, you guessed it. The one I made on my 52nd birthday. I mean, come on, what are the odds? I was about to start taping an episode about the same video, and now suddenly I'm getting an email from a stranger telling me, oh, by the way, Mel, I saw that video on your 52nd birthday, and I followed the steps in it, and now my life has changed? What are the odds? Those are magical, and I always pay attention to that kind of stuff. So I reached out to her. I talked to her on the phone, and now I want you to listen to her read the email she sent to me yesterday. I just love this kind of stuff because it all connects. And before I play it, I want to warn you that this may be triggering for you to hear. Because when Danielle stumbled upon that 50-second birthday video of mine, she was in a way worse place than I was up in that bunk room. She was thinking of ending her life. Your birthday saved my life. The video you made on your 50-second birthday was the first Mel video I had ever seen. And it was the last day of my life, or it would have been. A couple years previously, I had made a pact with one of my best friends that if either one of us were thinking about suicide, we would call one another and we would talk as long as we needed. And at the end of the talk I had with him the night before, he made me promise him that I would give my life 24 more hours because a day can change everything is what he said. And the next day, late afternoon, waiting for night to come, YouTube said I should watch your video. And I promised my friend 24 hours more, which I spent largely watching your videos. <laughs> and I'm still here. You know, and it sounds a little bit even silly, but um, I remember at one point in the video when she just, you know, she got to the point where she had laid it all out there, how she feels and what's going on that she said, so this is what I'm gonna do. 
I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy myself some flowers. And I was like, okay, I get that. Like, you know, I mean, happiness isn't like a goal that like once you've completed all these things in your life that are wrong with it, then you're allowed to be happy. It's something that you actually have to try to do every day. And, and you can't just do this one little thing and that can make today better than it was. I mean, come on now. Don't you just love Danielle? And look, over the past year, Danielle has been slowly chipping away at creating a better life just like I have for these past two years and just like you're going to do now that you've listened to this episode. See, doing the little things every single day that align with where you're going and who you want to become, that's the secret. It works. The bottom line is you have the power to change your life, period. You have to act like the person you want to become before you feel like that person. And if I can do it, you can do it. Plain and simple. There are things that are locked in your heart and your mind and soul that are calling to you. Stop denying it. There are changes that you want to make. Stop ignoring those changes. The whole point of this episode is to get you to not only believe that change is possible for you, but to start taking the steps to make the change a reality. I want you to claim what you want by the end of this episode. I want you to close your eyes and envision something amazing in this next year of your life because yes, you can change. And yes, you can take the actions that will make that change a reality. I mean, is it going to happen overnight? Of course not, but it'll change over time. And if you can make today just a little better, guess what? You can make tomorrow a little better. And if you can have a better day, then you can have a better week. And if you can have a better week, you can have a better month. And those months lead ultimately down the path to the life that you envision for yourself. You deserve to be happy. And I believe that you're listening to this episode right now with Mel Robbins because you are meant to. I mean, think, you could, you could, have, picked, you could have picked a million other episodes, but you are on this one right now with me. Why? Because you're supposed to hear this at this exact moment in your life. You needed the reminder that there is something bigger that is meant for you. You got so much amazing stuff to do with this next year of your life. You got dreams to fulfill. You got lives to change. Stop focusing your energy on the stupid crap that weighs you down. It does not matter. Your past does not matter. The things that you're worried about, it doesn't matter. I mean, who cares if they didn't read your text? Who cares if you didn't get that job you applied for? Do you know how many jobs there are out there? It's time to see the bigger picture. It's time to focus on what you want. I know, I get it. It sucks when you get the courage to ask somebody out and they say no, or you work for months trying to close a massive sale and it goes to somebody else. And it's an awful feeling to wake up and have the depression be overwhelming. And you're not going to feel like kicking ass today. You're going to feel like licking your wounds. I got it. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Have a good cry. Give yourself a hug. And then dig deep and let Mel Robbins remind you of who you are. There is power inside of you to face this and to make it better. And you know it. In those moments when you feel like you just got punched in the gut, you have power within you. You have the ability to create this fresh start, to close your eyes, to envision what you want instead of surviving through what you have. On those mornings when you wake up with the weight of the world on your shoulders, wake up and get your ass out of bed. Get dressed, get yourself out the door and do the things that make you feel slightly better. Start acting like the person you want to become instead of the person you are today. Start taking actions that align with what you want in your life. It's only when you start to act before you feel ready that this turns around. I get it. You should have landed the funding. You did deserve the job. It does blow when you don't get into your dream school and your best friend does. But you know what? That's not going to stop you from getting what you want. Because you 
are going to pick yourself back up. You know that this is going to pass. You know that through your actions and your attitude, you can change where you're at. And you know that you can make yourself feel a little bit better no matter what you're facing. And you can't tell me otherwise. Every single day when you wake up, the clock resets, the past expires, and the future, it is yours to create. There is an open road. There is a blank page. There is a wish that you need to turn into a reality. Today is a gift, and you get to decide what you're going to do with that gift. Is it one day or day one? You decide. You decide with the actions you take today. You can change. And today is the day to prove it to yourself. So go do it. I'm here with my friends and colleagues, Lynn and Amy, and we are talking about just going through these seasons of change. It's a huge drop off, back to school, new job kind of season as we're recording this right now. But this is a topic that is pertinent any moment in your life. And I didn't realize how deep this was going to go. Mm. Because I thought we were just going to talk about tips for college drop-off. Yeah. <laughs> it's no, like, but it's like or you... back-to-school anxiety. And now I'm like, <laughs> I never went home after I went to college. <laughs> Sorry of all this shit about not living close to my parents and I mess up. <laughs> um, and you just asked me, would I handle it differently? First, I have a confession. I secretly hope Kendall doesn't end up in L.A. Hmm. And I hmm. notice I'm a bit of an asshole. And anytime she does any kind of griping about the L.A. scene, I'm like, yeah, you know, you really are just like an East Coast person. And I realized <laughs> that I am doing this because I desperately want her to move yeah. back to the East yeah. Coast. You're allowed to do yes. that, I think. And That's she okay. was saying that, you know, when her friends said goodbye this weekend, they were here for her birthday and a bunch of them were moving to New York. She got really sad and was like, I wish I was going to be in New York with all of them. Mm. And I'm like, eventually you will. Bah. You could live in L.A. for a year and then, you know, move back. Yeah. Um, so I'm being an asshole because I'm starting to plant that stuff. So I got to <laughs> stop doing that. Um, I could absolutely have a ball moving her in. I would get very teary when I said goodbye. Yeah. Um, and I think part of it is because instead of holding the confidence that this is going to be one of the best years of your life and you're about to do the thing that you've been wanting to do forever, and I can't wait to see what you produce this year in terms of your music career. I think about like all the shit that impacts me. God, mm. I'm getting older. Wow, these kids are, oh. you know, sprouting their wings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, like time's flying. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, how did this, like I start going there and get very self-reflective and I'm gonna use what we've talked about today to stay in the space because I have a choice. I don't have to torture myself. I don't have to make everything so deep. That's what Kendall always says to me. Not everything's that deep, mom. You know, just because you're moving me into an apartment doesn't mean you need to get that deep. Yeah. You could just stand in confidence and go, go get them. Yeah. Good luck paying your bills because this is it. This is the moment we've been waiting for. <laughs> um, and I think what you both have said about like sort of flip the switch, know your role in that moment. Yeah. Don't let it get too deep. Be confident about what's about to happen for them and exude it so that they can borrow it from you. Yes. Yeah. That fucking helps me. Thank you. Does anything else come up for you guys in terms of those moments? And then I'm going to share one story quickly that is super important that I think everyone will get a lot of value out of. I had something come up, but I totally forgot what it was. Yeah, I just think that, you know, what you just said is, is great. And like, you might get emotional, but that's okay. You can get emotional with them and tell them you've got this, like, this is what you want and really ask them questions because maybe she does want to go to New York, but maybe she doesn't. Right. And oh, so she does. She talks about She does want to go. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> That's but awesome. I, I think, it, you know, it's like we that would be music to your ears if she wanted to change her mind. But you don't want her to give up on her dream either. So it's like really being the one, the voice to ask those probing questions, even when we might want something, you know, mm. and it's really up to us to say, well, what, you know, what would your path look like? And just make sure that they are making the decision not to please us because, I could get really comfortable with that. Like I could totally lead that. You're okay right? with causing that I, much I, guilt I, trip I, for people, I, I right? I could, I could. 
<laughs> but would I be serving my kids and their futures? No, I wouldn't. So, you know what else this makes me think of is those phone calls I got from our daughters when they were first at school, sitting alone, crying. And I'll tell you what really helped is this idea of narrowing their focus. Acknowledge that it's hard. Say you're not the only one, but you got to narrow their focus. Let me tell you what I mean by that. My friend Carrie Lorenz, who's the first female uh, F-14 fighter pilot, wrote a book called Span of Control. And in an emergency situation, there are only three dials that matter in a fighter jet. That's it. And you got to narrow your focus so that you can gain control. And so if you are going to get that teary phone call, I don't think I can do this. Somebody's crying from the bathroom stall at a new job. Or, you know, after a big sports practice at a new team that one of your kids has made, they're like really upset. I don't think I can narrow their focus. What can you do in the next hour? What can you do in the next hour? What could you focus on? Because part of what happens, I think, in these moments of change, whether you're at a new job or you're sitting in your dorm room alone, is you're like, I don't know what to do. I'm in a new neighborhood. What do I do? I feel like a dork. I feel like the only one. I don't know anybody at work. I don't know what people are talking about. You have to get out of your office. You have to get out of your cubicle. You have to get out of your room and you have to force yourself to start walking around and talking to people. That'll make you feel better. It's the same thing when we moved here. Like I wasn't going to meet anybody if I sat in my house and cried. I had to get to the coffee shop. I had to push myself out of that freeze mode and through my discomfort and keep reminding myself, Mel, this feeling is normal. You're going through a big change. It's going to pass, but bitch, you got to do something about it. Like you want friends, you get your butt out there. And the same is true with you and the same is true with the people you love. Another thing that's really helpful is that if somebody is overwhelmed by going through change, a lot of times the response to it is to freeze. As you've been learning in a lot of episodes, freezing and procrastinating is a kind of anxiety or even a trauma response to something very overwhelming. And change is always overwhelming. It's just part of the duality of it. We were learning this today. Um, is coach the people in your life to put some things in their calendar. Take a look at what's going on this week. What could you plan to do? Who could you reach out to uh, at, you know, that you've met in the DMs and set up a lunch? Who could you ask to go to the cafeteria with you? Those sort of breadcrumbing of dates with people or things to do or sign up for this event so that when you look at you ca your calendar, you see forward motion. Yeah. I got a call from um, a gal that I consider to be like one of my daughters. You know who you are. And she had pulled over on the side of a road and was calling me because she was having a panic attack. And I asked her, okay, well, tell me, first of all, tell me, what do you see around you? So I used that grounding technique where you go, tell me one thing that you can see. Tell me, you know, something that you can hear right now. And then we started breathing together and I told her to put her hand on her heart. And so we like helped her drop into the moment and really ground into her body. And the dogs are barking right now. It's okay. We're going to just keep on rolling because this is one of those hot on the mic uh, kind of episodes. Um, we started talking and she was explaining all the stuff that was going on. She had just graduated. The job that she was starting had been delayed. The family has just moved. Mom has a big job. Um, her grandfather's sick. And what I said to her was this. I said, you know, the fact that you're upset and kind of panicking right now tells me that you're mentally healthy. Because mm -hmm. anybody going through this level of change and that much transition, you should feel completely turned around. And so the fact that this is bothering you tells me you're well. Yeah. And yeah. I also want to remind you that it's temporary. And the most important thing that you could do is to remind yourself this is temporary. Uh, the fact that I'm bothered by all of this change and I'm upset about it and I feel out of sorts is a sign that I'm doing well because I should yeah. feel out of sorts. I'm That's in a true. new environment. There's a lot of change going on. And the same is true when you move back to school or you start a new grade or you start that new job. It's a sign that you're mentally well if you're turned upside down because everything is new. And your body needs time to process the new environment and the new rhythm and the new people around you and the new space that you're living or working in and the new commute and the new everything. 
And it's really a good sign that even though you're excited, you're nervous and you feel activated. That's because there's so much new stuff for you to learn and absorb right now. And so if you can remind yourself that it's temporary mm -hmm. and if you can take a deep breath and tell yourself that the fact that I'm upset about this change doesn't mean that it's going to be bad. It just means I'm going through change. This is yes. my process. And I want to personally say to you two, thank you, because when um, I am not dropping off Kendall, but metaphorically, I'm going to think when I say goodbye to her on Sunday night and she and Chris drive down, mm -hmm. I'm going to put my hands on her beautiful cheeks and I'm going to mm -hmm. look her straight in the eye and I'm going to say, I know that this is going to be hard, but it's only going to be hard for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I believe in you. And remember, this is how you do change. It sucks for two weeks. Just get into a good rhythm, and before you know it, you're going to be better than you ever imagined. I love you. Go get them. And then I'm going to turn around, I'm going to pull my shoulders back, and I'm going to stomp away from her like I meant it, because I do. And as soon as I turn the corner, I will collapse and hug one of the dogs and start crying, because she's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> sounds right. <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> and that's how we do change here on the Mel yeah. Robbins podcast. That's right. Yeah. I love it. Like some fucking powerful bitches. Yeah. That's how we do it. <laughs> Fantastic. My biggest takeaway today is just this idea of being a surrogate of confidence for somebody else. Just because somebody that you love is upset, you don't have to cry with them. In fact, it's better if you just acknowledge that this is hard and then say, now pull up your big girl panties and get your ass out there and go make some friends. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.